It originally um, was developed because uh, the founder of Hospice of Queen Anne's, Mildred Barnett, who the hospice house is actually named after, um, had heard that other hospices across the nation were offering children's bereavement camps. And she loved the idea of it, and she recognized the fact that children are the forgotten mourners and that they, too, are trying to, whenever we suffer a loss, you know, more than likely there's a handful of children that suffered the same loss in a family system and that they need a safe place to go to and to be able to deal with those emotions. So at that time, she went to her bereavement coordinator and she said, I want you to look into what this looks like. What, how do you create a bereavement camp for kids? And so they started in the summer of 94 with, I think, 18 children. And it has continued to evolve and grow over the last 30 years. It's just, it's been an incredible experience. And I was just um, telling someone the other day that one third of our adult buddies, and those are the adults that are assigned to a child for the duration of camp, were a camper themselves. When you can say that, that gives so much um, validity to exactly the kind of work we're doing. When kids recognize how important that kind of camp was in their own healing and then feel led to come back and be a part of that fabric, it's, it's why we're still doing it. It's why we can. So there's a lot of planning in the background. Um, we've been working on camp now for a, a few months. Um, so we are very deliberate in the way that we assign our children their adult buddy for the, the three days. We go by common likes, like maybe we have a little soccer player and we know that, you know, Joe, who's one of our adult buddies, loves to kick around the soccer ball. Or maybe they had a similar loss. Maybe Joe lost his dad when he was 10 and the little guy we're going to assign to him, is, you know, just lost his father or a parent. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into um, assigning people to where they're going to be. So our buddies, um, they get a lot of training. We, they have to come to a mandatory orientation as well. And then our group leaders are all very seasoned volunteers who have been doing this for years. And we sit and we create a curriculum together every year. We have a theme every year. So it's really um, a collaborative effort that we spearhead, but that everybody sort of gets to weigh in on so that we're all on the same page. Uh, so there's a lot of planning that goes into yeah, it. Yeah, because I noticed when I was out there that the assignments were direct. I mean, it looked like they'd already kind of had a bridge mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah. Sherry, what's up? Uh, tell me about your experience um, during, are you actually at the camp during the camp session or do you um, work primarily in, outside of that? No, I, I don't work actually with the, the kids portion of it. I am I'm solely in with the adults part. Um, so I am there the whole time. Um, and from, from the time the adults show up on Sunday afternoon until closing on Tuesday afternoon. So most of the time it is a parent or guardian or someone who um, is taking care of the child who is in camp. However, it doesn't I always have to be that. It could be an adult that is just going to be a part of the adult part of the retreat and not the family part who is going through um, grieving. Sure. Um, uh, of course, it's, it's not something that's going to happen, you know, totally in those couple of days. However, they, you do um, see periods um, or, or little moments of when um, someone gets, you know, an aha moment or they, they, they hear something um, that's going to help them or something that has shed some light on something. Um, and, you know, a little bit, a lot of healing does take place. However, you know, a lot of healing will continue to take place after the camp from the tools and the things that they've learned. And they just found a new community where they can actually share that and feel so 
much less alone. You know, grief is very isolating on just a very natural level when you can spend time in the company of others who are brokenhearted. Suddenly, the big feelings you're having make sense. Mm -hmm. You feel less alone, less abandoned, mm -hmm. right? So I would have to say that's probably the biggest takeaway is I learned I wasn't alone. Right. That's a great question. And yes, we do. Um, we do a lot of grief support in the schools. So last year, well, the 23-24 school year, we provided grief support to about 140 kids in all three counties. So we always make it very clear that it doesn't have to end there. And then sometimes it works the other way. We got them to camp. And then they want to know, well, what else can I do? And we get to say, well, we can come to your school. And that works out really nice, too. Because some, some of those kids get get brought to camp sort of like not kicking and screaming, but kind of kicking and screaming. But at the end, they're like, why isn't this longer? Um, and so they find that they're actually they're looking for more. They're looking for more opportunities to feel um, a part of something that makes them feel less unusual mm -hmm. or less different, mm -hmm. you know, because grief is another thing that can make a kid feel really different from everybody else. I find that our community at large, as they continue to understand the kind of work that we're doing, they truly want to get behind it. And some people will think, oh, well, I can't volunteer because I'll cry the whole time. But there are so many other ways to be involved. And I mean this sincerely. There's no way that we would have lasted 30 years without every one of our community supporters. There's no way. We can't afford to do it ourselves. It's become such a big project that there's a lot of moving parts. And if it weren't for people who have different talents and people who have different, you know, gifts of supplies and that kind of thing, it, this, would, this would just be a thought and not a reality. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, loss is a constant in every one of our lives, whether it's from death or loss of a relationship or loss of health, loss of wealth. Um, the grieving process looks very similar in any crisis. So people understand that and, and they know how they felt. And so often we'll hear from adult, um, adult um, grievers and they'll say, I wish when I was a kid this kind of thing existed. So we're proud of the fact that we're able to say we've had longevity. And honest to goodness, most of it is because of all the people who are standing there lifting us up, enabling us to do it. I started as a chaplain, actually, um, about seven years ago, and just um, being a part of the closing ceremony to the family camp. And then when I became full-time grief counselor in 2018, um, I was a part of the family camp and um, helped to um, co-facilitate some groups. And so later on, um, I was part of coordinating and continued to be a, a coordinator of it, and um, here I am. <laughs>